The greatest Sanji moment in the series just happened. In chapter 1031 of One Piece, Sanji was pushed into a dilemma we had never seen before, and his response to it showed us the essence of his character, as well as the essence of Oda's own style of storytelling, reminding us that he is an author who, above any other, is defined by his long-term vision and planning. With this moment, we can finally see the full flow of ideas between Whole Cake Island to Wano, the complete arc of what Oda had in mind for Sanji. So what do I mean by all that? Well, before we get into it, make sure to subscribe for more One Piece content every week. And just like Sanji's raid suit used to help him turn invisible, so too can you become completely invisible with Surfshark VPN, the sponsor for this video. Surfshark VPN makes it so that you can become absolutely undetectable online, and you can switch your location to virtually travel anywhere on the globe. So what does that mean? Well, first of all, your data is encrypted, meaning what you do online can't be tracked by anyone, including Surfshark itself. On top of that, no ads, no malware, you are essentially going ghost on the internet. But on top of that, now you can move your location around to anywhere you want to go on the globe. Why browse Netflix in America when you could be browsing Netflix Japan? The same applies for any streaming service and any site. So not even just TV shows, even international sports streams that are only available for free viewing in other countries are now free to view for you as well. You can get Surfshark today for 83% off and four months free by clicking the link in the description below and using my code MORGE. You get a 30 day money back guarantee so you have absolutely no risk. Just hit the link in the description below and use code MORGE to start using Surfshark today. So that aside, let's break down the complete vision for Sanji's character that Oda crafted over the last 200 chapters and to do so, first we have to quickly go over who Sanji is in general, what is the most important part of his character, what is the point of his character. Oda likes to represent different ideals through different characters, particularly through the Straw Hats. For example, Zoro is the embodiment of ambition and drive, as well as loyalty. Luffy is the embodiment of freedom and strength of spirit, etc. Sanji is Oda's ultimate depiction of what it means to truly live by a code. Sanji's entire character is defined by his code of honor, which is a lot more than just never hit a woman, even though that is one of the most easily recognizable aspects of it. The broader concept is the notion of chivalry. Sanji is a character who above any other straw hat will always, always put himself on the line for the sake of another. Yes, all the straw hats protect each other, but Sanji is the straw hat that Oda most frequently and most explicitly places into that white knight role. The first chapter that Sanji's chivalry was first emphasized as the key part of his character was literally called Chivalry vs. Fishman Karate, with Sanji actually chivalrously diving underwater to go save Luffy so that Zoro wouldn't have to, putting his body on the line instead of Zoro's. And this act of chivalry is what that fight was about, with Kurobi explicitly challenging the idea that Sanji's chivalry could hold out against overwhelming odds. And that really sets the tone for what we see of Sanji throughout the rest of the story. How many unforgettable moments such as the thanks for a light scene are a result of Sanji throwing his body on the line to save someone else? It doesn't matter who it is, his code dictates that he is always going to put himself on the line of fire before anyone else. We see him do this over and over again. The code of chivalry is what Sanji lives by, to the point that even people he really dislikes, such as Kinemon when they first met, Sanji will still take the responsibility upon himself to help him when anybody else would have abandoned him, even if it means putting his life on the line. So not hitting women in general is part of Sanji's code, but chivalry in general is part of the larger code that defines Sanji, as well as the strong sense of debt and right and wrong. We were introduced to Sanji with the notion that Sanji was willing to essentially take infinite abuse and injury as long as he felt that he had a debt to be repaid to Zeph. And as we later learned, Sanji was even sacrificing his dream for the sake of paying back his debt to Zeph. This is something that Sanji never really grows out of. Going all the way to Whole Cake Island, Sanji's code dictates that he will always put others first before his own happiness. 
And that brings us most importantly to his code as a chef. It is highlighted that Sanji is all about kindness, but how that really manifests is through his code as a chef. That from the start of the series, Sanji already was locked into the mentality that he would feed anyone who was hungry, regardless of if they were friend or enemy. And it was this kindness that first made Luffy realize that he wanted Sanji on his crew, not Sanji's actual cooking ability. This code as a chef is so strong that Sanji would even feed an emperor of the sea that is trying to kill the crew if that emperor happens to be hungry. And the value that Sanji places on being a chef is so high that his entire fighting style is dictated by his code as well. He is the only character in fiction that deliberately does not use his hands to fight simply because it goes against a personal code of his. So all of that is to say that Sanji is a character who is defined from top to bottom by his code to the point of irrationality. He will never hit a woman. He will never fight with his hands. He will always live chivalrously. He will throw away everything he has to repay a debt. And he will always, always feed anyone who is hungry. Most of the things he does are plain stupid and illogical. A lot of these concepts he lives by are honorable on paper, but we all understand that in reality there should be exceptions to every rule, except for Sanji. Sanji is a character who lives with no exceptions. And even though that is a fundamentally stupid way to live in real life, and that is acknowledged in the series itself, again, a lot of Oda's main characters are extreme, exaggerated, hyperbolic depictions of certain ideals. The same way Zoro is a depiction of grand ambition, to the point that he would rather be dead than be anything less than the absolute best in the world. So too do we see this chapter that Sanji would rather kill himself than be a man who cannot live by his own code of values. And so let's talk about this chapter, 1031. Why is this so special for Sanji? What is happening here that is fundamentally different than anything Oda has done in the past? Well, in general, because Sanji is a character who is defined by staying true to himself, and Oda literally wrote an entire arc focused on that idea that this is one character who is not supposed to change, who is conceptually supposed to be the embodiment of living life while unrelentingly abiding by your personal code of honor, of morals, of chivalry, etc. The challenges that we see for Sanji as a character throughout the series are usually not ones where he is forced to change. I've touched on this before, but we regularly see arcs and particularly fights where the other Straw Hats have to learn and grow. But for Sanji, the challenges Oda comes up with are again usually about forcing him to deal with his code of honor. Sanji's first full fight in the series against Kirubi, again that was a test of Sanji's chivalry in a life or death battle. Sanji did the honorable thing by playing the white knight for Zoro, but the test was whether Sanji could survive what he committed to. In Alabasta, we see Sanji's code of never hitting a woman put to the test against Mr. Two, who keeps changing into Nami, and again, the challenge is sticking to his code and finding a way to win while never breaking it. Similar scenario in any Lobby, only this time the situation is unwinnable, yet Sanji still sticks to his code and ultimately Nami takes up the fight while Sanji gets a more suitable opponent, perfectly illustrating the point of having allies, as I'll do what you can't do and you do what I can't do. In Whole Cake Island, Sanji's code was put to the test in many ways as I discuss here, but most prominently was probably his code as a chef, where even in the face of a rampaging Yonko, Sanji still did not back down on the notion that he must feed literally anyone who is hungry. Throughout the series, you'll see setups like that for Sanji. The challenge is sticking to his code, and the Whole Cake Island arc in general was something of a celebration of the idea that Sanji always chooses to be himself and stay true to himself. He can't throw away his morals and leave his family to die. He can't hurt Pudding despite everything she did to him. He can't ignore a starving person. And even though he is limited in so many ways by his code, he is ultimately rewarded for sticking to those ways. His family actually fights for him and protects him in return. Pudding falls in love with him and helps him. Big Mom still isn't able to catch them in the end. So if all of his greatest challenges are tests of Sanji's ability to stay true to himself, then this chapter, 1031, finally brings things full circle to something new, a new exploration of his character that desperately needed to happen even if we didn't realize it. The question that is raised is what if Sanji literally could not stay true to himself? What if, biologically, 
his old sense of self simply disappeared. What if the thing that defines him, an unwavering code of honor, an unwavering code of morality, simply ceased to exist? It starts with potentially hitting a woman, but Whole Cake Island was so important in that it established everything that comes with becoming like Jerma. It established to be like Jerma is to be everything Sanji is not. Sanji would no longer have a code of a chef. It is not in Jerma's nature to care about such things. Sanji would no longer be the white knight defined by his kindness and chivalry. Jerma are cold-hearted soldiers. Everything that Sanji defines himself by, we were shown that Jerma are the opposite. And so now that Sanji is, against his own will, being transformed into a Jerma soldier, we have such a fresh new challenge for the character. Because we have already seen over and over throughout the series that if Sanji's code is put to the test, no matter what, he will never break it. The new scenario he was given is what if it's no longer his choice? We know that he will never consciously break his code himself, no matter what happens. So what then if he thinks that his actions are becoming unconscious? If he thinks that it might no longer be up to him whether he can stick to his code? If he thinks that he will break his code whether he is aware of it or not? Up till now for Sanji, it's always been about finding a way to succeed despite sticking to his code. But this scenario took things a step further. This conflict was about what Sanji would do when he thinks that he literally can't stick to his code. And the decision Sanji made when this possibility appeared is probably the most defining moment for his character in the series and one of the greatest character moments in One Piece history. Sanji asks Zoro to kill him if he completes his transformation. As if Sanji cannot be true to himself, if Sanji cannot live by his ideals, then Sanji would rather be dead. It is reminiscent of this moment for Zoro against Mihawk, when Zoro realized that if he can't achieve his ambition, then he would rather be dead. Or similarly when Zoro realized that if he can't protect his captain's dream, then he would forfeit his own dream. These are the types of moments where you get to the essence of a character, essentially putting who they are and their values not just to the test, but in the context of an absolute ultimatum. Either you can have your ambition or your life, your loyalty or your ambition, and finally in Sanji's case, your code or your life. It's a very One Piece style of character writing for the main characters to commit to certain ideals to such a grand, unreasonable degree, but that is precisely why it's such a compelling story with characters that feel larger than life in many ways. Again, we have always gotten the sense that Sanji would be willing to die for his commitment to live honorably, but in every scenario so far, there has always been the possibility of survival. His goal has always been to try and win and succeed while sticking to his ways. This is the first time that it's been a true ultimatum. The simple option A or B. If Sanji, outside of his control, transforms into a Jerma soldier and simply biologically cannot stick to his ways, then he would immediately choose death rather than live like that. And so why did I also say at the beginning of this video that this whole scenario exemplifies Oda's long-term planning? Well, first I'll mention that on a very basic level, chapter 1031 makes me look at previous scenes within the Wano arc that I had mixed feelings towards very differently. For instance, the Black Maria incident. At first, it just seemed like a repeat of the Khalifa incident, but with just the basic added character development of Sanji being willing to ask for help, which seemed like, you know, an okay idea, though somewhat repetitive and eye-rolling. However, with the new context of what is happening to Sanji, it actually feels right that Oda included a scene like this as a callback to that controversial Khalifa incident, where Sanji stuck to his code to such an unreasonable degree, as it's a quick reminder of who Sanji is and the extreme lengths that he goes to when upholding his code. That type of callback is a good reinforcement for the reader to add greater shock value and weight to Sanji thinking later on that he is turning into someone who may break his code. Similarly, Sanji casually using his raid suit, even though he was previously so against everything Jerma stood for, was not actually Oda being inconsistent, rather it was Oda being deliberately misleading. Oda had Sanji momentarily think that maybe Jerma science isn't all that bad, only for him to then face the reality of what Jerma science means in a much more important situation, where his choice to destroy the raid suit without hesitation now carries a lot more weight as Sanji has already tried out the raid suit and seen that it helps him in combat, 
Therefore, the decision to destroy it is a bigger sacrifice as Sanji knows what he is giving up and has no doubt that he would still rather stay true to himself as long as possible rather than make the mistake of even considering using Jerma signs again. So just looking back at within the Wano arc itself, I think it's clear that a lot of Oda's choices were more intentional than I and some others thought. But looking back at the big, big picture, Really, it all starts with Whole Cake Island, a very controversial One Piece arc that I long defended with Sanji's character arc, or arguably lack thereof, being a particular hot point of discussion. Even as I defended Sanji's storyline in Whole Cake Island, explaining how it was in fact a test and celebration of everything that Sanji stands for and his way of living, I'll admit that I also felt that in some ways, it was almost incomplete. It felt like something more could have been done with his character there that Oda chose not to broach. In reality, it's easy to forget, but Whole Cake Island is a part of the same Four Emperor saga that Wano is. So Whole Cake is a lead up to a far larger and more important storyline. And through that lens, seeing what is happening with Sanji in Wano, it now becomes far more clear to me that Whole Cake Island was just the first part of a larger story for Sanji. In many ways, Whole Cake Island answers a question that Wano raises. What would Sanji be without his code? He would be like the rest of the monsters in his family. As so many readers complain about and criticize Sanji's character, would he be better off if he wasn't so stubbornly himself? No, Sanji is great the way he is and this is the man that Luffy needs on his side to become Pirate King. Even as Sanji wonders what would be more helpful to his captain, we already have been shown the answer. By crafting an entire arc to establish these points, it makes it that much more powerful when these questions suddenly become a life or death dilemma for Sanji. An important character conflict has arisen, but the arc beforehand built the foundation for the decision that Sanji makes in this chapter. It is that much more meaningful because it's coming off the back of Whole Cake Island's lessons. And this moment where Sanji chooses death over sacrificing his sense of self carries weight precisely because we spent so much time establishing the importance of that sense of self. That is great storytelling. That is how Oda plans across hundreds of chapters. He knew what the conclusion of Sanji's character arc in Wano looked like from the start of Whole Cake Island, and so many moments that made readers doubt him, like getting the raid suit at the end of the arc, were necessary beats in the larger story that Oda was setting up. Not to mention the larger scale vision of how the storyline of Sanji's actually represents what Oda may be thinking of for many characters across Wano and the connecting themes between Whole Cake Island and Wano. A lot of people have talked about how an important developing theme of Wano is identity, with many characters hiding their identities, trying to find their identities, or having new aspects of their identities revealed. But that's all really just a continuation of the primary theme of Whole Cake Island, of the importance of being oneself, with characters like Sanji, Katakuri, and Pudding having to learn this lesson. And the clear congruence between the ideas of Whole Cake Island and Wano tell me that Oda has a larger, more layered message that is being developed across these two gigantic arcs making the conclusion of Wano particularly enticing as there is clearly something more complete that Oda wants to say about the importance of being yourself and personal identity that can only be fully developed over the course of two arcs. Sanji himself is simply an important microcosm of this long-running thematic thread, as he is the only character whose thematic message is being developed as a carryover across both arcs. And if you enjoyed this video, then definitely like, comment, and subscribe. And you can support me on Patreon to get my extended thoughts on this and all future topics. And you can use my code MORGE to get 83% off Surfshark and four months free. Link in the description below. Thank <laughs> you.